Hey, my name's Alex. Um, I host the podcast. Maybe that's how you know me. The podcast is called Alex Listens. Um, maybe you don't know me. And in that case, hi, I'm Alex. Nice to meet you. Um, you should look, you should listen to my podcast. Uh, there I interview people and I talk about philosophy and ethics and race and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty fun. I guess it's my main project at the moment in my life. Um, and yeah, so this is my first YouTube video. So hi, YouTube. Um, I don't know what else to say to you apart from hi. Um, but yeah, I, I'm hoping to start recording some videos of me speaking because um, it's nice. It's nice to watch people as they speak and not just listen to them. And I guess the podcast is mostly um, audio. Well, it's, yeah, pretty much entirely audio. Um, but I guess I decided to start making videos so that people can watch me speak if they like. Um, yeah, I have a website. You can find most of my other work on there, www.alex.co. I'll put a link in the bio. Um, and otherwise, I don't think I have anything else to say um, apart from if you want to support the podcast, you can. If you want to support this video, you can. Tell me stuff. Send me an email. Message me on Instagram. My email address, all the details will be in the bio. So click on that. Um, and that's pretty much it. So, yeah. So today, um, I'm going to be talking about Michel Foucault. Uh, a 20th century French anthropologist, philosopher, social critic. I'm not entirely sure what you'd call him. Um, and there are many, many reasons why I've decided to do an episode just on his thinking. Um, but one of them is because I feel I personally, as someone who's tried to read his work and has struggled, um, because it's very... Uh, confusing and very abstract. Um, but I feel like there aren't many theorists or philosophers or social critics who are as uh, as important to think about today um, in 2020, which is a really long time um, after he died, but also after he was writing. Um, I think he died uh, in 87. Um, don't quote me on that. Um, I'm sorry. I don't, he, yeah, I don't have the dates written down. All I have written down, uh, I don't know if you can see this. Um, yeah, Foucault, whoops. Foucault, power, knowledge, surveillance. Um, those are the three things that I'm going to talk about. Power, knowledge, and surveillance. Um, yeah. Okay, so who is Foucault? I guess I've already told you. Um, he died of HIV. Uh, he was gay. Um, and his main things, the main things that he spoke about and the main things that he wrote about were power, um, how individuals relate to each other, what it means for us to relate to each other, um, and uh, knowledge. So how our epistemic, the things that relate to the things that we know, how our epistemic horizon, so all the things that we know, how that influences who we are and how that influences the way we engage and interact with the world, with others, with ourselves. Um, and the last thing that I said was surveillance. Um, and this is the thing that is kind of, I think, the most masterful part of Foucault's theories and Foucault's theorizing. Um, so yeah, I guess Foucault has pretty much anticipated all of the changes, the tech changes um, in the 21st century that have moved us closer towards uh, mass surveillance. Um, think about Snowden, um, that PRISM, the PRISM software security surveillance thing that the NSA were using. Think about um, the social credit system in China. Think about the increasing kind of 
presence of CCTV and anyway, I'll get to all that kind of stuff later. Um, but that's just a kind of brief summary of what I'm going to be talking about and why. Um, so let's begin with the first thing. Also, this is totally unscripted. Um, this is how I do my stuff because but I guess it's a really kind of hedonistic reason. Um, but I enjoy it the most like this. I really like the way it feels to kind of free flow through thoughts and stuff. Um, and yeah, I guess if you're looking for something super scripted, you're not in the right place. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, topic one. Power. So what does Foucault say about power? Um, well, one helpful place to begin is a kind of binary distinction that he uses and that he relies on in a lot of his um, writing. So Foucault speaks about soft power and hard power. Um, I'll begin with hard power first because it's a bit easier to understand and a bit easier to explain. Um, so hard power refers to things like the law and um, things that are codified and things that are, um, I guess, obviously telling us not to do something. So hard powers say, don't do this, don't do that, don't jaywalk, don't steal, don't, um, don't not pay your taxes. Um, yeah, that, uh, hard, hard powers, I guess uh, the most, uh, the simplest way to put it is hard powers tell us what, what to do and what not to do explicitly. Um, and I guess what's helpful about hard power is that we can look it up. Um, we can ask a law, the law agencies, law enforcers, police, whatever. We can look at legislation and we can see what we ought not to do. Um, and then I guess from that, we can extract some vague lesson about what we ought to do. Um, and yeah, um, I'll talk about this. I'll just kind of uh, foreshadow or um, signpost the idea of normativity. Um, I guess what is normal was something that is, that was of great interest to Foucault um, because hard power kind of explaining that certain behavior is right, certain behavior is wrong. All of these things contribute to our understanding of normativity and um, how we ought to behave. Um, yeah, okay. I hope that was sufficient. Um, so soft power. Now soft power is a fair bit more confusing uh, and abstract and more difficult to kind of isolate than hard power. Um, but that's entirely the point. So soft power refers to the kind of forces on the individual, which are uh, the forces on the individual, which kind of mold them into the, into the person, um, who the kind of person who they are. Um, and that is a very strange concept to think about um, because the ex the existentialist philosophers, um, I did an episode on this, uh, kind of, um, it's called On Being Philosophy, the philosophy of being. You should listen to that if you're interested in um, the existentialist philosophers. I also wrote a blog post about it. Um, you can look at that too. I'll put links in my bio, whatever. But the existentialist philosophers um, they, a few of them like, uh, Sartre and, uh, Camus, uh, a lot, they think that we have this kind of radical and really powerful freedom. Um, so we're, we're so free that, that we can kind of make what we want of the world. Um, and that we can draw a difference between who we are and the influences of the world. Um, and so, so Foucault's claims about soft power undermine the claims of the existentialists because, and I agree with Foucault. I don't think that we have, I don't think that we're ever so free that we can't 
that we can escape the kind of constraints of that society places on our that society place on our identity. I don't think we can ever get to a place where we can say I exist totally free from the structures around me. Um, I am not influenced by my family. I am not influenced by the people around me. I am not influenced by my peers. I don't think we can ever say something like that. Um, and the reason why we can't say something like that is because I imagine a lot of the time we're unaware of the influences that the people around us have on us. Um, it's very hard to quantify. How do I know how much a relationship is impacting me? How do I know what psychological influence my parents had on me when I was younger? Um, these are very difficult things to think about because it, it almost feels like it's part of the human condition to be unaware of this kind of stuff um, because maybe it's not that helpful. Maybe it impedes on how much we're able to do um, because if we're constantly thinking about the way things influence us and if we're always able to trace kind of uh, the way something has influenced us, if we're able to trace the way we behave back to a way that it's influenced us, maybe that's really cognitively demanding. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure why we have a hard time influence, have a hard time understanding how things have influenced us. But soft power refers to all of those things, the way we're socialized, the way we conceive of the world, the way people around us conceive of the world. Um, and a lot of the time, uh, we don't know how I've, yeah, I've already said this. Um, we don't know how kind of the way we've been socialized has defined us, has informed who we are. Um, and that's, that's precisely Foucault's point. Um, soft power is nebulous. It's unclear. It's undefined. Um, but it's extremely powerful. It molds us. It provides us with a basic understanding of what's right and what's wrong. Um, but not, it doesn't codify it. There isn't a book of soft power influences. Um, we, we look to others. We look to our parents. We look to role models. We look to other people's behavior to try and figure out what we ought to do, what we ought not to do. Um, and maybe a lot of this is subconscious. Um, it's, it's hard to tell. Maybe it's something worth uh, taking a moment to reflect on. Um, okay, so... Basically, that's what Foucault thinks about power. Um, hard power, soft power, these things. We can't ever escape relationships of power. Um, the world is essentially one big playground of varying power relationships. Um, yeah, think about all of the kind of... Here, here's another thing that um, Foucault talks about. Um, think about all of the relationships of the different kind of hierarchical power relationships that we're constantly engaging in. Um, I'm a student. Uh, I have a professor. The professor talks to me in such a way that they explain things to me. And because of the nature of the relationship, um, I'm supposed to treat them as having some kind of expertise. Um, and and expertise is another thing that Foucault talks about. Um, so built into hierarchical relationships, parent, child. I don't like using the word hierarchy because I feel like it's been totally taken by like the Jordan Peterson kind of uh, bro who's like, yeah, bro, like hierarchies, man. We're all lobsters. Um, but whatever um because yeah i guess these relationships are hierarchical parent student sorry teacher student parent child doctor patient expert novice um and for foucault what is important about these relationships is that one person or one body or one group of people are claiming to have access to the truth um, and, and they are trying to share that truth 
with people who aren't learned, with people who don't know the truth. Um, and we are supposed to the people who don't have don't have access to the truth are supposed to trust that the people with access to the truth are going to do the right thing and that they actually have access to the truth so um nietzsche a german 19th century philosopher nietzsche talks in his book uh the genealogy of morality um which is a really interesting concept um a genealogy is a family tree and he try, Nietzsche tries to trace um, morality back to its point of origin in order to truly have an understanding of what is right and what is wrong. Um, and in that book, Nietzsche explores the relationship uh, of the priest and the sinner. So the person who is uh, the person who has transgressed, and then the person who has access to the truth. So. For Nietzsche, um, when we go to the confession booth, which I've never done, um, but when the sinner, the person who has transgressed, when they go to the confession booth, you know, they say, oh, Father, I have sinned, I've done X, Y, Z. And then the priest goes, oh, well, here is normativity. <clears throat> um, here are... <clears throat> here are the ways that you ought to think about the world. Here are the ways in which you ought to behave. And then as the sinner, you're supposed to kind of mold your existence around the ways of being that the priest has told you are the appropriate ways of being. Um, and for a long time, that power, and currently still, I imagine there are many people who rely on that relationship for the mor for moral guidance and for moral instruction um and and that that's a very powerful dynamic imagine the kind of power that you'd have if you were able to tell someone that this is what is good this is what is bad um and Ni nietzsche nietzsche thought that that was a problem because he thought that it took away what it means to be a person um what it means to be a strong person because when you turn to that kind of, when you place so much authority on that kind of figure, you relinquish your capacity to self-author. You relinquish your capacity to define the world yourself, um, to think about things yourself. Uh, and maybe I'll do another episode on Nietzsche, but for Foucault, the reason why this is fascinating that kind of hierarchical preacher, transgress, transgressor, that relationship Foucault thinks is eternal. And it just changes shape occasionally based on like what context society or what the kind of priorities of society are. So I guess in the 21st century, a big priority of Western countries is medicine. Um, and therapy and and psychiatry um and psychiatry is what Foucault would call an expert discourse um and an expert discourse is so a discourse I guess refers to a set of things that are being said about a particular topic and an expert discourse is something which has been granted kind of superiority or great strength or um you know, it's kind of self-justifying. It doesn't need proof that it's the truth. It just is the truth. Um, and so when we go and see a psychiatrist, Nietzsche and Foucault would both argue that essentially it's the exact same structure as the priest transgressor. You walk in, you say, hey, um, I've got some problems. I'm doing some stuff wrong. Then you explain why you're doing things wrong. You explain how you're doing things wrong. Um, and then the psychiatrist has this amazing power to kind of say, yeah, you are doing things wrong. Be like this. Don't do that. Like, stop this kind of behavior. Start doing this. And you're supposed to walk away and be like, oh, yeah, of course. Of course, I was doing it wrong all along. Um, and then, you know, you change the kind of person who you are and you begin to frame it and mold it around the conception of 
what is normal behavior that you're provided with by the psychiatrist. Um, again, look at these crazy, look at these, uh, look at these power, look at this power, look at the power. Like the, it's, yeah, it's hard to just, if we think about morality, it's amazing that it's amazing that we are able to place such faith in anyone because after like a psychiatrist has had amazing training, you know, well, I hope they've had amazing training. They've been to university for a long time. They've learned a lot about pathologies and neuroses and whatever. And then we're supposed to trust them um, when things go wrong in our head um, or when we, when we begin we're supposed to trust them when we begin engaging with the world in a way that is abnormal and they're supposed to direct us back to normativity and to normalcy. Um, but yeah, I guess it's a very strange concept um, that we, f we feel as though we can give someone, we feel as though we can give someone like, we can give someone that power and we can give them that control over our lives um because who are they like they're just a person yeah they've got some training but really like they're not perfect i'm not perfect um but maybe that's the only way that society can function if we do kind of place that trust in people but foucault would say hey like it's an expert discourse right we trust it we place a lot of faith in it but how do we know that there's not going to be another social change. Like what if there's like enlightenment 2.0? What if we move from, like we move from, I don't know, a society where the priest was the purveyor of the truth to a society where in terms of what is normal, the psychiatrist is a purveyor of truth. What if there's going to be some other, like another leap? What if like enlightenment 2.0 is a jump from um, medicine to something new that we don't know yet, that we're not familiar with. Um, and what does that mean for, for morality? Um, if morality is being articulated by someone in a new position that, yeah, like how, how, how yeah, I guess Foucault, the question that Foucault is encouraging us to ask is how do we know that these relationships of power how do we know that they are true? How do we know that they are doing the right thing? Um, what even is the right thing? What is the concept of right? What does that mean? Um, but it seems quite strange that so frequently we place amazing authority in the hands of certain people who have access to certain discourses, um, to the doctors, to the lawyers, to the politicians of society. We, we give them amazing authority over our lives. Um, and we can be critical, sure. Um, I'm very critical. I'm a very kind of, I'm a skeptic. Um, and I imagine that, yeah, I, I know many people who are kind of skeptical of the authority of certain groups. Um, but really, like, you know, if I go, if, if, if I'm unwell, you know, I'm going to trust the doctor. Um, and I will feel safe. I will feel more safe in the hands of a doctor than I will in the hands of, um, someone who hasn't had medical training. Um, and why is that? That's because, yeah, one, it's empirically, most of the time it's empirically tested and, you know, we ought to have faith in things that kind of, that seem to be truths or they're truths until they're, um, disproven. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, Foucault nudges us to think about these things that we do in our life, where we kind of suppress our own inner narrative about what the world is going to be like. And then we give, we give authority to these other people. Um, and that's, that's, it's just a strange thing that we do. And that, you know, the worst thing, the worst thing for Foucault is, if you don't actually know that this is something you're doing. Um, and if like you've gone through 50 years of your life without realizing that 
you're surrounded by relationships of power and you have power over some people and some people have power over you and you're kind of negotiating all the time between you know uh, what am what are you giving me what am i giving you like how how is this working are there some situations where i'm expected to give more like in this position presumably me as a as like a person on youtube who's talking about a person foucault presumably i have i've like you the listener has granted me with some kind of authority um because I'm talking about this person. I've assumed the position of someone who is an expert or whatever. Um, And that's really strange. Like, it's strange how our relationship with knowledge almost demands of us like a kind of an entering into that relationship. Um, But obviously not all the time. Um, There can be really kind of equal relationships where people kind of you know there's bilateral or omnilateral communication and there isn't like a hierarchy there isn't the teacher pupil dynamic um yeah and i mean in an ideal world we would have those relationships in many places um but maybe a question that we need to ask is like should we like should we should there be positions like doctors and stuff in society where we kind of unquestioningly trust them? Um, yeah, that's something to think about. Um, and that's something that Foucault would encourage us to think about. Um, do, do we just trust these people because they are experts? Um, yeah. Okay. So I feel like I've spoken about power and knowledge a lot. So those are the first two. I don't know if you can see this. I'm sorry if you can't. Power, knowledge. Number three, surveillance. Three. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about that now. Um, yeah. So. I decided to speak about surveillance last because I wanted to kind of set up the... Foucauldian framework. So the relationships of power and knowledge. Power informs knowledge. Knowledge informs power. There's kind of this confusing hard power, soft power thing. Then there are expert discourses. There are people that we kind of grant a lot of authority to, to tell us about the world. Um, and and maybe maybe you're kind of suspicious of everything that Foucault has been talking about. Um, maybe you don't. Maybe you don't like his kind of rendition of power dynamics and um, and knowledge. Um, but I think one thing that one thing that is extremely important to think about is the way that power can manifest in the world. Um, so one way that power can manifest in the world uh, is in surveillance. Um, and a lot of what I've spoken about so far has hinted at the uh, hinted at an at one idea of normativity. Um, and what is normativity? Um, what is considered normal? Um, there are some people who say, "Ah, oh, you know, I'm just a normal guy." Um, we often describe people as being unusual or strange or weird. And presum- presum- presumably, that's because they are those people who we describe. I don't know, like, I often tell people that I'm a pretty weird guy. And like, what does that mean? Does that mean that I'm deviating from a normal, like a normal way of engaging with the world? Um, what does it mean? Does it mean that like, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um but like normativity is, yeah, normativity is this thing. It's this thing that we, like, some people want, some people don't. But like hard power, the laws and stuff, I imagine that an objective of the law, you know, punitive law, law that punishes people, um, that 
it it tries to render and kind of secure and maintain a conception of what is normal um because what is normal is what is safe and what is safe can be trusted and you know if there are we want to live in a safe society or whatever um okay so surveillance um i'll begin with the panopticon um and the panopticon is a prison system that was designed by the utilitarian philosopher jeremy bentham um and jeremy bentham is in a box like he like his body is in a box at university college london which is where i'm studying um and you can see his body like his face he like wanted to keep his face in a box at the university um maybe he was a narcissist um probably um it's really weird if you're ever in london you should you should go and look at jeremy in a box um yeah it's really strange seeing like i don't know how old he'd be like i don't know 200 maybe maybe older um no when was ucl founded 1850 maybe so yeah i don't know 170 160 um but yeah it's very strange anyway Jeremy Bentham designed this prison structure. I'll put an image of it here. Maybe that's helpful. So, um, the prison structure, uh, it is essentially a, there's a watchtower in the middle and the watchtower has glass that has one way glass. So you can only see from inside the watchtower to the outside world you can't see inside so if you're outside the watchtower you can't see what's happening in the watchtower and then around the watchtower are the cells with the prisoners and the prisoners have one-way glass so oh well maybe they don't. It don't i don't think it matters but actually they probably don't have one-way glass um and i'll get to that so the prisoners just have normal glass so you can see the prisoners can see out, but they can't see into the watchtower. So maybe they can see each other's cells. Um, but the th one thing that they can't know, they can't ever know if they're being watched because they can't see into the watchtower. They don't know where the person in the watch or the people in the watchtower are looking. Um, and Foucault takes this idea of the panopticon and says, this is one of the ultimate forms of power and one of the most nefarious and wicked forms of power because if you don't know that you're being watched at any given point um you begin to and and let's say you don't want to be punished you begin to kind of self-regulate you begin to kind of you begin to mold the kind of person who you are, mold the kind of person, yeah, who, who you want to be around the things that, the behavior that isn't punished. So let's say I'm walking down the street and someone jaywalks and there are no police around or anything, but there's a security camera that's filming that road. Um, and then that person gets a fine and somehow I find out and then I begin to think shit like what if I'm being watched I probably shouldn't jaywalk I don't want to fine and then I change my behavior but no one needs to say anything to me the law doesn't need to tell me don't do this there's no hard power it's just kind of soft power I'm being nudged I'm being pointed go this way do this don't do that whatever um and and I guess, you know, we, at least I don't feel like I live in a prison. Maybe some of you feel like you live in a prison. Um, but as we are more and more surveyed, as we're being watched more and more, um, it feels like we, ha we can be less and less certain that we're not being watched and that, you know, like you need to go to great lengths to, to avoid being spied on like you need a vpn to avoid a virtual proxy network to avoid um 
to kind of scramble your IP address. If you don't know what a VPN is, um, <laughs> your, uh, yeah, your internet security has probably been jeopardized many times. Now I'm just fear mongering. Um, uh, and yeah, you know, if you want to do some weird stuff, you go onto the dark web, whatever, um, or you download a, uh, like a really encrypted browser. Um, yeah. And, and all of this, the surveillance and kind of not knowing whether you're being watched, but also knowing that you don't want to be punished, you kind of embody all of this fear that, you know, someone is going to tell you, someone's going to show up at your door one day and be like, don't do that. Or like, you're going to get locked up for being bad. Um, and so, yeah, you kind of, you change the kind of person who you are based around an image that you've created yourself of, or that you're kind of being given of what is acceptable and what isn't. Um, and yeah, like, I don't know if any of you have seen that Black Mirror episode where there's the kind of social credit system ranking. Like if you jaywalk, you lose points. If, you know, you give someone a compliment, you get more points. I don't know, something like that. And I think um, China has implemented a similar kind of social credit system where, you know, lifestyle decisions and that kind of stuff can influence how likely you are to be employed. And then if, you know, you're not acting, you don't act in a good way for long enough, you lose so many points that you're not allowed to travel anymore. You lose your passport. Um, and employers have access to your social credit ranking and kind of your history of petty crimes or whatever. Um, and yeah, think about think about the kind of psychological uh, psychological impact of not knowing whether or not you're being watched. Um, and for Foucault, we have reached... If he was alive today and he was aware of the ways in which we are watched by governments, by other, by foreign governments, by whatever, by companies, Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, whatever. And, you know, our voting tendencies are being influenced by the ads that we receive. Well, think about advertising. What's advertising trying to do? Advertising is trying to tell us that consuming one thing or doing one thing in particular is going to make our lives better. We'll be happier, whatever. Um, and, if Foucault was around, uh, he would be, I think he'd be terrified. Or maybe, maybe he would just think, wow, like we have really reached um, a very sad time in our species where I imagine lots of people don't feel like, I have a friend um, and one time I asked that friend whether they ever feel like whether even when they're in their room whether they act as though they're not being watched and they said no they always act as though they're being watched as if like you know your webcam is spying on you or whatever um and yeah i think that's really that was really upsetting to hear and i wonder what that does for people's self-expression and for their ability to kind of share the truest innermost parts of themselves with the world um Maybe, maybe in some cases it's good that people aren't sharing their truest innermost selves. But um, I don't know. Like, I imagine a lot of people have a lot of beautiful stuff to share. Um, so yeah, that's what Foucault thinks about power, knowledge, and surveillance. Um, thanks for watching. Um, if you want, if you want to hear some more stuff, go on my website, listen to my podcast, Alex Listens. Um, if you found this video helpful, please let me know because I'm only going to make them if people find them helpful. Um, so yeah, comment on the video, whatever. Um, send me an email, please. Uh, follow me on Instagram, Alex Listens, Alex, A-L-E-K-S. Don't you dare write A-L-E-X. That's not good. Um, yeah, otherwise support me on Patreon. Um, I'll put a link in the bio, uh, and tell me what other stuff you'd like to hear. Who are the, which other theorists would you like me to talk about? Um, yeah, cool. Okay. Uh, until next time, have a nice, I hope now you're enlightened and you walk around and you'll see a security camera and you'll be like, 
I know, I know what you're doing. Anyway, bye.